Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Glad that you could return for another segment. In this segment, we're going to be having a conversation with Dr. Genevieve Neal Perry. She's joining us here as chair of UNC School of Medicine, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology to talk about some data from the Phase 3 Skylight 1 and Phase 3 Skylight 2 clinical trials concerning VMS. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Neil Perry. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Neil, for having me. Tell us a bit about yourself briefly. What was it that brought you to medicine? Oh, gee, um, uh, that, that is a great question. Really, um, what brought me to medicine was basically like lived experiences and, uh, you know, growing up in a community where um, health care was a little bit more limited um, and just seeing the consequences of, um, of inadequate and um, inequitable care um, access was really the driving force for me. Now, these clinical trials that we're going to talk about, what exactly do they concern? What is VMS and who's impacted? Yeah, so VMS is is, is what we call vasomotor symptoms or what most people will call hot flashes or hot flushes. And um, most commonly when people think about it, they think about it in women who were making their transition from um, uh, the transition into menopause and that perimenopausal period or, or that menopausal period in one's life when, when the ovary stops working and stops making estrogen, um, women will have these episodes of feeling very hot. And typically the um, sense of hotness is above the waist and, and involves the face and, and they just happen spontaneously. Um, they can happen at night and cause frequent, frequent awakening, um, which in itself can be very disruptive. Um, if someone is waking up multiple times at night, then they're fatigued, they're not able to think as clearly, um, you know, it can be very uncomfortable to be in a meeting and then all of a sudden start sweating. Um, so you can imagine what message that might send, um, you know, in, in someone who's not aware of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, vasomotor symptoms, and when we think about them, we think about the ones that are bothersome, that really disrupt, um, you know, the quality of life of those in- impacted. Uh, other individuals who may have hot flashes are people who are using um, medication for cancer, mm-hmm. um, and the cancer medication may reduce the hormones, and that will trigger these hot flushes. And this could be both men and women. Um, most often, we you know we think about it in, in breast cancer um, uh, survivors who are receiving medication to reduce hormones that also will cause them to hot, have hot flashes. Do these symptoms affect heart rate or blood pressure, or is it simply the sensation of being hot and the sweating? Does it affect any any other uh, systems? You know, that's a great question. Sometimes people can feel anxious with them, but usually, um, you know, it's not associated with um, significant blood pressure changes. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, people can become a a little bit agitated because, you know, they're in a, in a place where they're in a meeting and all of a sudden they start to feel hot. Um, and so it can be um, disruptive from the perspective of, you know, they, you know, they're sweating in the middle of a meeting and people are looking at them and it, it can be very uncomfortable. The Skylight 1 and Skylight 2, was this data presented in one meeting or were there several different meetings that this information was presented in? So, you know, um, as, as the data has um, been accumulating, there have been different meetings where uh, different um, levels of information were available and were presented. And so um, information was initially presented about the overall design of the project, um, some of the early findings and um, uh, the work that was presented at um, the Endocrine Society reflected a full year of, of studies. Well, let's get into some of the uh, the takeaways and findings of these studies. Is it appropriate just to talk about one and then the other, or can they be combined? Yeah, I think they can be combined, um, and, and I'll give you a little background. So, you know, we talked about who has hot flushes. Um, we didn't really talk about why they happen. Um, and so one of the reasons uh, we're able to kind of have this um, drug development and have this fast forward motion with the treatment of hot flashes is because over the last uh, five to 10 years, we actually finally understand the biology. Um, For many years, we knew they happened. We knew they were more common around the menopausal transition and menopause, but we really didn't understand what, what was, what was driving the, you know, this, um, these physiological changes that um, that individuals were experiencing, and so what um, what we've been able to find 
um, is that in the hypothalamus, which is a, a region in the brain, uh, like a region deep in the brain, where um, there are neurons or nerves that are really engaged in um, reproduction and engaged in um, kind of how your body regulates um, regulates stress and regulates um, heat and, and kind of temperature modulation. Mm -hmm. and, and what we found is that in this area of the brain that there's these neurons called candy neurons. Um, we spell that K-N-D-Y um, with a little Y mm -hmm. um, and other letters uppercase. And what these neurons are, these neurons make um, these um, what are called neurotransmitters um, and these neurotransmitters are um, kipeptin, um, neurokinin, and dimorphin. And in the absence of estrogen, these neurons become super active. And they release these um, neurotransmitters will actually stimulate themselves as well as stimulate the neurons that recognize changes in, like, in your thermal regulation. And so these neurons are kind of behaving in a, in a hyperactive way, and that triggers these hot flashes. And what we've been able to, to find is that specifically the neurokinin, if we block that, um, that peptide um, with a selective antagonist, and an antagonist is like a blocker, right? So the antagonist prevents things from happening. If we block it, then we can actually reduce both the number or frequency of hot flashes, and as well as the intensity. And it's only because of understanding that biology that we're really able to fast forward and, and identify um, this compound and, and, and be able to demonstrate its effectiveness. So what is this antagonistic compound? It's called fesalinitin, mm -hmm. and it's a neurokinin-3 receptor antagonist. What are the clinical implications uh, based on the data? How is this going to change how VMS is approached going forward? This is uh, an, another great question. Um, for for many years, um, kind of the, the the best treatment that was available for hot flashes was estrogen, right? We know it's related to estrogen um, withdrawal, and if you give back estrogen, it works. Um, the problem with um, estrogen is that not everybody can take it because they may have cancers, they may have other medical problems that um, prohibit them from using estrogen. And then there are also women who, um, who don't want to take estrogen because they're just concerned about their family history and, and what risks may be associated with them taking estrogen. And so there have been some what we call non-hormonal. Remember, estrogen is a hormone. And so the goal is like a non-hormonal um, regimen or treatment that works really well. So there have been a few um, non-hormonal um, regimens, um, some of what we call uh, selective, uh, excuse me, um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SRI, um, SSRIs, um, that have been used. And, and there are some other agents that have been used that just have not been super um, effective and they don't work the same across all race and ethnic groups. Um, for example, um, women of color, African-American women can metabolize um, SSRIs differently than non-African-American um, women. And as a result, it doesn't, it may not work as well in, in, in African-American women to treat their hot flashes. So you have this gap where you have this disparity, you have women or individuals with hot flashes and, and they can't um, use hormone replacement. And then the non-hormonal um, treatments don't, don't work as well, um, as well as some of the non-hormonal treatment that's been available have lots of side effects. So what is um, really fresh and exciting about fesalinitin is that it is really effective. It, it works um, within, um, within a week. You see significant reductions in, in uh, on both the number as well as um, the intensity of hot flashes. It is sustained throughout um, treatment. Um, and uh, there is also a benefit in terms of, of, of some improvement of sleep. And so having something that is highly effective with very few or limited um, kind of side effects is something that we really haven't had on the market. And that is what makes fesalinitin so exciting. Mm -hmm. And so, so, you know, kind of 
timely, um, you know, when we think about how do we take care of our patients and how do we reduce disparities in, in treatment outcomes. Well, doctor, is there a website where we can learn more? Yeah, um, you, you can actually go to um, endocrine.org. Uh, they will actually have um, a version of my talk about the drug there with some slides that um, demonstrate the um, findings. Um, there is also um, ACOG um, 2021, where the meeting where they would also be able to find information about on um, the study. And uh, lastly, uh, taking control of, of menopause um, would also be another site where they could find um, relevant information. And I do believe that ACOG site is ACOG.org, A-C-O-G yes. dot org, correct? That's correct. Great, great. Doctor, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. Thank you so much for lending us your time. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Genevieve Neil Perry. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.